Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our February 3rd, 2015 um, meeting of the City of Everett Planning Commission. And we will begin with our Planning Commission roll call. Chair Stewart? Here. Commissioner Sosin? Here. Commissioner Adams? Here. Commissioner Jordison? Here. So we are missing a few members tonight, but we have four commissioners, so we do have a quorum. Our next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes from our last meeting, which was January 20th. Do any of the commissioners have comments on the meeting minutes? Nope. I found one just small edit on the last page 11 um, in the section called plan review schedule, the second paragraph. Um, refers to Commissioner Stewart, strike Commissioner, and say Chair Stewart. Do I hear a motion to approve the meeting minutes from January 20th? I would move to approve them. Second. Commissioner Jordison? Yes. Commissioner Adams? Yes. Commissioner Sosin? Yes. Chair Stewart? Yes. All right. The minutes are approved. So next we... Um, We'll listen to any reports that uh, planning commissioners have, starting down at the end with Commissioner Jordison. Uh, I don't have any report. I would like to find out what the status of the issues around the CEMEX uh, site are uh, with, in terms of there were some neighborhood issues with the dust and so forth, and I noticed that uh, We've, we go through there a lot because I'm in the adjoining neighborhood and at uh, Seavers Ducey Road sometimes seems to have a lot of silt uh, or, or uh, I know that they're, they're watering the site, but I'm just kind of curious about um, uh, it, it, the rain typically washes it all away, but uh, you know, intermittently there, there seems to be an accumulation of dust on the streets around that, that site. And I'm just kind of, I will be curious to know if there are any updates on that. Uh, that can be brought uh, from the from the planning department. Alan Giffen, planning director. Uh, we can uh, look into that and report back to the planning commission at a future meeting. Okay. Commissioner Adams. No report. Commissioner Sosin. No report. Thank you. And I don't have a report this evening either. Does staff have any comments? Uh, yes, Alan Giffen, uh, planning staff again. Just a reminder that we have a planning commission meeting, special meeting uh, next week, not in our regular uh, calendar. Uh, that'll be next Tuesday, the 10th. Uh, the subjects will be uh, the um, I-502 recreational marijuana business land use regulations uh, will be one item. A second item will be a proposed change in the location for the Trinity Lutheran College student housing and the third item would be a code amendment that uh, commission agreed to initiate at January 21st meeting related to boundary line adjustments. And so those packets, I believe, uh, if you haven't received them, uh, they'll be passed out tonight. And uh, so that uh, will be our uh, third, or we'll, we will have a three meetings in, in February, therefore. Um, haven't yet figured out about a third meeting, whether or not we'll have one or propose one in in March, but uh, some of that will probably be dictated by uh, what comes out of the workshops next week. Okay, thank you. And then we have a time um, now for citizens to make any comments, and um, we'd like you to focus on items that aren't the um, two items that are scheduled on our agenda. So if anybody has any comments, you can, now's your time to ask those or make those statements. Seeing none, we'll move then into item number one. This is a request for the Planning Commission to sponsor a code amendment to allow a special property use permit in the B2 community business zone for buildings or outdoor storage of vehicles, equipment, or materials used by a public agency. And I'll turn it over to staff. Thank you. Uh, Alan Giffen, Planning uh, Department staff. We have received a letter of request from the Washington State Department of Transportation asking that we initiate a code amendment uh, that would relate to one of their proposed facilities 
Uh, they own the uh, more majority of the property in at the uh, Eastmont Park and Ride, uh, part of which is unused at this point. Uh, some of it is used for offices, some of it's used for park and ride, and they have an area that's fenced off uh, that they would like to uh, be able to locate a uh, road maintenance uh, facility with buildings and uh, perhaps some outdoor storage areas. And our code does not currently allow for even the consideration of such a use in uh, the B2 zone. That they're, What they're asking for is that we add uh, some regulations that would allow for uh, that type of use through a special property use permit process in which the neighbors are notified. Uh, there would be a public hearing before the hearing examiner and uh, additional conditions uh, if necessary beyond what our uh, codes would require for development uh, could be applied through that process. And so uh, we feel that that's a good way to uh, address the, these types of facilities to make sure that the neighbors have uh, public uh, notice and that uh, there's a, a hearing process and um, the uh, hearing examiner can sort out uh, comments and apply additional conditions if necessary. So if the uh, commission uh, is in agreement with uh, staff's recommendation to initiate consideration of the code amendment. That does not bind you to any decision or uh, approving the requested amendment. It just starts the public process on considering the code amendment, and we will bring something back at a future meeting uh, for uh, your consideration. Uh, don't have a date scheduled. Uh, we'll see if you agree with the recommendation first. Um, I had a question. I'm wondering if um, this, the process that's outlined here, would that um, not allow us to discuss a potential rezone to a different category um, for this type of use? Would be, we be just focusing on the um, particular zone, the, B, the B2? Yeah, and as suggested uh, by the uh, letter from the Department of Transportation, since their property is zone B2, they were uh, preferring and staff felt it was would be a more straightforward process to do a code amendment that would uh, uh, not involve rezoning the property. If there were a requirement for a rezone to, say, an industrial zone or something like that, that probably... Uh, to get beyond the specific use of the DOT maintenance facility uh, and open it up for industrial use would probably have uh, the potential for more impacts on the surrounding community. So uh, in our conversations with DOT, we suggested this is a more tailored and narrow uh, approach than a comprehensive plan amendment and rezone. Okay. Um, do any of the commissioners have questions about this? I have a couple of questions. So I, I, now I'm familiar with the site because I've used that parking ride a lot. It's a being it's a, it's becoming a more kind of emptied out for a long time, and now it's being utilized again because there are so many people commuting to Seattle. But um, <coughs> I'm familiar with that specific site, and I'm just curious as to why WashDOT, as a state agency, now, um, there's an attorney sitting next to me, so he might have a better answer uh, than anyone else, but why can't they just apply eminent domain uh, and do whatever they want? I mean, why would they have to revise our code? Uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't have objection to a site-specific, location-specific, you know, uh, variance of use, but why would we change, why would we allow that use in a B2 zone and this location where there might be other locations where we clearly would not, wouldn't, would not want that type of vehicle storage type of use. I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm asking as the devil, sort of the devil's advocate in a sense, uh, uh, why wouldn't they just go ahead and do whatever they want? Because they're, you know, they're higher up on the food chain as it were. Well, that was their first argument, but it didn't uh, actually uh, sort when we uh, sorted out with our own legal staff, they do not have uh, preemptive rights over our zoning in the city. They do have to comply with our regulations, and uh, I think that's the way that most people would want it. Uh, uh, the Navy might be a different uh, animal, and they could preempt our regulations, And uh, so, but uh, 
so in this case, they are choosing to ask for the uh, code amendment. And to your point about this may not be a uh, type of use we'd want to allow in other B2 zones, that's why we have recommended that they ask for the special property use permit process in addition to the regulations and development standards that would normally apply within a B2 zone so that it could be a more tailored review on a case-by-case, site-by-site basis if uh, other sites were uh, contemplated for this use. And for the purposes of the DOT, uh, this is a very strategic location where they have several uh, state highways that uh, uh, are in very close proximity uh, to this facility, and so this will give them a lot more uh, operational uh, responsiveness and, for example, snowstorms and, uh, and just for other ongoing maintenance uh, uh, needs during other times of the year. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I do. Um, are there other properties that WashDOT owns within the city that might be also requested to do this type of storage and maintenance? Or is this their only piece of ground in the B2 zone? As far as I know, it's the only piece of property that they owned they, that they own in the B2 zone. They have some property up on North Broadway that's in the Broadway mixed use zone. Uh, in this case, the code amendment would not apply to that particular uh, maintenance facility. Would um, this use be considered an essential public facility, would you think, because of? Um... Uh, probably not. It's it's probably doesn't rise to that level of significance in terms of uh, the Growth Management Act. It's something that's absolutely a necessary function, whether it's an essential public facility in the, something more li along the lines of a, a college or a hospital or a, uh, an electrical uh, uh, power plant or something like that. Uh, I don't think it rises to that level of uh, stature. Okay, any other questions? So do I hear a motion um, that the Planning Commission would like uh, this code amendment to be initiated? So moved. I'll second. Commissioner Jordison? Yes. Commissioner Adams? Yes. Commissioner Sosin? Yes. Chair Stewart? All right, thank you. thank you. So now we move into item number two, which is um, going to take considerably longer than, um, than the last item. So we're beginning our workshop <coughs> on the 2015 to 2035 comprehensive plan update. And there will be a number of elements that we'll be discussing this evening. And then staff will, between now and probably mid-summer will be um, bringing us other elements for consideration. So the elements that we'll be reviewing tonight include a brand new element called climate change and sustainability and the urban design um, and historic preservation element and the economic development element. So I believe we're gonna take these one at a time, but maybe I'll turn this over to staff to introduce the first item, the climate change and sustainability. Mary Cunningham Planning. Um, as um, Chair Stewart said, this is a new element that's based on some of the new um, policy direction that comes out of Vision 2040 and the um, countywide planning policies. Um, and back in October, we came before you with a background report on climate change that looked at a lot of the documents related to this and what the city had done, has done already related to climate change and addressing that. Um, at that, um, we've revised that background report um, for several, and I'll go through the major changes. The, um, we added a little bit more information on ocean acidification, which was um, a new fact sheet that had come out related to, related to ocean acidification, and then links to some videos um, by Taylor Shellfish Farms that talk about the impacts of acidification on them being able to grow shellfish. 
Um, Paul Roberts spoke at that meeting and made, um, um, had some additional language he, or background he wanted added related to the risky business report that was in the background report. Um, and so we expanded the discussion in there on the impacts to the economy, the bond and stock markets, as well as insurance, real estate, and businesses, just brief information. Um, Commissioner Tisdell commented that the uh, background, he wanted more information related to energy efficiency retrofits for um, homes built prior to 1980. And I couldn't find anything that specifically related to homes built prior to 1980, but I added some information from a report called um, Unlocking Energy Efficiency in the U.S. Economy, and they looked at um, how much energy savings you could get by retrofitting homes up until the year 2020 based on um, existing technologies. And they found that you could get six times as much energy savings as you could by the energy efficiency that was going into new construction during that same time frame for housing. And then the same thing for commercial buildings, they found that retrofits would save three times the energy as you would get by the energy efficiency in new commercial structures. So we added that and then um, Paul Roberts also brought in new information regarding the um, Puget Sound Clean Air Agency policies and the Department of Defense report, and so um, that information was added to the background report. Um, the and that report is now on the it's on the website and. Um, it does include links to all the documents. So if you click on the link, it'll take you to the main document so you can see all the background information. And the detailed science beat that's related to all those studies. Um, So section one is an introduction to the climate change and sustainability element. And it mainly talks uh, about the, the um, biggest impact we're going to have in Everett probably on reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions is through our land use and transportation policies and um, making sure that we promote dense compact development um, that supports bicycling, walking, and transit use. Um, and the other major thing about the introduction is it refers to how all the other elements of the comp plan relate to this. There's a lot of overlap between all the elements and there's a lot of discussion about, there's policies and all the other elements that relate directly to reducing the impacts of climate change. And the land use and transportation elements are probably the most directly related, um, where they direct growth to centers and arterial corridors that are served by transit. Um, and speaking of that, I gave you a handout, which was um, a minor revision to, the, uh, to that introductory section that came from traffic that talked about, you know, instead of um, these elements focusing on reducing trips by single occupant vehicles, that it, they focus on reducing roadway congestion by encouraging balanced multimodal facilities. So um, fairly small change there. Um, some of the other elements, you know, you're going to hear tonight about the urban design and historic preservation element has a lot of policies that um, have the potential to make Everett very livable in these dense, um, compact communities a lot more livable. Things that are in there will attract people to live in Everett. If we can't attract people to live in these dense communities, we're not going to be able to um, have the impact on reducing vehicle trips associated with single occupant vehicles. Um, and, you know, there's also policies in there that um, Jan Meston will get into later about um, protecting and increasing the city's tree canopy and that, you know, those also have benefits for climate change for the trees will store carbon and also 
um, provide cooling and that, that um, reduce some of the impacts of climate change. And the land use element, we also have, um, we had new air quality policies in there um, that are consistent with the, re the countywide and the um, planning policies and also the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency's policies that also address um, reduction in greenhouse gases. And then on the, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, you'll be getting the um, capital facilities and utilities element. And that's going to have a pretty, well, not a huge section, but a page plus of policies related to capital facilities, um, you know, the sewer, water systems, surface water systems, and how solid waste and how um, those utilities in Everett can um, respond to climate change. Um, so section two of the um, climate of the element is the goals. And these are pretty broad. Um, you know, it's basically, you know, we should improve air quality um, and reduce the impacts of climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and policies for um, integrating land use and transportation and quality of life to get those higher densities that um, can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, focusing on reducing long-term impacts on natural and human environments, and then, you know, adapting to the impacts of climate change. So they're all very general and broad. Section three um, gets into the policies and the implementation measures. Um, the first section is related to climate action plans, and we've had some discussion about that. Um, Policy one, though, starts out talking about the city should collaborate with other governmental agencies um, in, the, in the Puget Sound region um, to develop meaningful strategies for addressing climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. And um, we've had more discussions with some other folks in the in the area and to see what kinds of things they're doing. And we there are possibilities. Other groups are, are starting to work on this to a lot more greater extent, and we have the opportunities to be involved in some of that. Um, so the Puget Sound Regional Council has analyzed greenhouse gases associated with the transportation plan and energy use in buildings. Um, and this year, the Clean Air Agency is going to be doing a comprehensive regional greenhouse gas inventory that um, should be helpful for applying to Everett also. And, and the Puget Sound Regional Council is also starting a, a regional collaboration on um, adaptation to climate change. So they've, they're getting, they've just started and they've got like a focus group so far that includes um, the University of Washington, um, some port folks, emergency managers, economic development folks, and planners, and they're just starting to try and create what their um, what their what effort they want to go to define um, what work they're going to be doing. Um, and then the um, Snohomish County Office of Energy and Sustainability has a second staff person now that. Um, has increased their capacity to do some work. And so there's been some discussion of working with the cities in Snohomish County to do a countywide uh, regional um, greenhouse gas inventory and also potentially to look at um, efforts beyond that. What can be, what, what were, are some of the best strategies to reduce greenhouse gases? Um, so this section also, um, we talked at the October meeting that the city has um, a plan called the Climate Action Plan for Municipal Operations, but it doesn't, it hasn't been officially adopted. It doesn't have goals for a reduction of greenhouse gases in it. So this element includes a policy saying that the city should update that plan and include some goals for, um, 
what the city thinks can be done with the municipal operations to reduce greenhouse gases. It also includes a um, policy to do a community-wide climate action plan that does inventory greenhouse gases in the whole Everett community, not just from what activities the city itself is doing, and then coming up with um, reduction goals and recommended actions for reductions in greenhouse gases and adaptation. Um, section B, 3B talks about public involvement, getting the community involved, doing public outreach to the community to build support for some of the actions that are going to be needed to reduce the greenhouse gases and also adapt to the changes. Um, I'm not going to go into all the policies um, unless there's questions on these, but I just want to go over the, some of the subject headings that are in here. Um, under There's a section on uh, policies related to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and there's land use and transportation strategies, um, policies related to buildings and energy use, solid waste reduction. And ag again, you know, in the capital facilities and utilities element, there's going to be a section in there on solid waste reduction because we have a solid waste utility that works with Snohomish County to implement certain actions. So there'll be a section in there on solid waste reduction, but um, there's also in here, there's some policies that are broader that looks at things that the community does and a lot of the neighborhood groups, like they have the garage cells and um, neighborhood cleanups where they do a lot of recycling and stuff. So there's a, a lot of overlap in all these subjects. We have uh, policies on the economy and supporting local um, businesses. Um, and then there's potential implementation measures. The next section is on related to adapting to the impacts of climate change. Um, there's general policies, the policies about extreme storm events, sea level rise. Oh, and um, at the October meeting, we had some discussion about being able to map sea level rise and not having the capacity to do that at this point with models. But in March, a couple of our staff are going to be going to training, our GIS staff um, that's being given for shoreline planners and others with GIS expertise to, it's a full day training um, to learn how to do that. So hopefully that's something we will have the capacity to do in the next year or so. Um, so other subjects in there related to increased temperatures, ecosystem responses to climate change, um, agriculture and food supply, emergency planning, and then again there's potential implementation measures related to those actions. So that is it regarding climate change. If you have any questions about specific policies, I'd love to get feedback, language changes, Anything that you have would be helpful. I guess one question that I had on page three, and for the members of the public, there are paper copies on the table, so feel free to help yourself. So page three, the um, at the bottom of the page, talking about land use and transportation, policy 10.10, .10, um, it talks about encourage higher density transit oriented development. And I started thinking about the different multi-modes. Um, and I don't think I saw in this element a mention of light rail. Um, and I was just wondering, and I'm sure we'll be talking about light rail and lots of the other elements, but I was wondering from greenhouse gas emission standpoint, if light rail is sort of the cleanest um, transit alternative as opposed to buses that are burning um, diesel fuel, presumably, if light rail is going to be supported by electricity so there wouldn't be emissions. I was just kind of wondering about that. and wondering if we should mention something about light That's rail. That's a great, great point. We can add that in. 
I, I was kind of thinking of that as part of transit oriented, but um, we should be more specific. So, great comment. Any comments? I, I, I didn't see anything, and I don't think it's uh, uh, conflicts with any policy, <laughs> but I'd like to uh, see uh, either uh, continued support or increased uh, uh, educational programs for K through 12 kids and as far as climate change. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a uh, any policy that would conflict with the Everett School District, but I'd certainly like to see. I, I have seen some some sort of uh, uh, some things with my daughter's education come through as as far as climate change, but. Uh, I'm not sure where it all where it all stands, or I'd just like to see more continued support for that, or even increased support for K through 12 education for climate change. Okay, I know our public works folks through the uh, as part of the um, NPDES permit, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. They do have contracts with some folks who do public education, um, and I I'll talk to them if, if that to see if this would fit within their capacity to do that. Thank you. Other comments? One small comment. Um, in the area of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in buildings and energy use, um, or mm -hmm. under land use or transportation, I would like to see more specific language about building design, including secured bike storage features and bike parking areas and that, that kind of thing. You know, we have, um, that's another one that parking where we have some parking policies in the land use element with a note saying we're debating whether they're gonna go in the transportation okay. or the land use, but we can certainly at least have a reference here. Wherever we put them, we'll, have, we'll make sure we reference them. Yeah, it is an overlapping topic. But I'd, I'd like to suggest that we also attach it to building design. Okay. And I'll bring it up again when we get to the urban design area. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Adams? Just a quick one. Uh, Good job, Mary, on, on putting this together and staff. I really appreciate the work that's gone into it. I just had a quick question on the extreme storm events. And I, maybe this has come up before, but the hazard mitigation plan, who puts that together and where does that come from? That is from the city's Department of Emergency Management, which comes out of the fire department. And they worked with the, um, a group out of the University of Washington. Um, and they had a big public process related to that. So it was recently updated. Good, okay. And then when we're talking about implementing those, when we're talking about implementing them in terms of our comprehensive plan, how did, because we're already part of putting that together, right? I was just, I was guess the question is, what do you envision by implementation when? Um, they have a lot of things in there related to um, addressing, um, like, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, it's been a while <laughs> since I've read that, but um, flooding events um, and whether the city had the capacity of the infrastructure, the crews to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, there, there also was some severe winter type storms where they talked about stockpiling sand and. Okay, um, those are good examples. So, yeah, that helps yeah. me with. I'm just trying okay. to picture exactly what how that would work. So it's capacities. I know you make that reference in here too, but that makes a lot of sense. So thank you. I had um, one question on page six, that same page. Um, it's a third of the way down the page. It's referring to the Community Housing Improvement Program, CHIP. And I had a vague recollection of when we were um, having the background information on housing. I had thought that the CHIP program perhaps has been replaced with a different name program, but maybe I have that mixed up. I just wanted to make sure that that had been updated. It, it's still the CHIP program. Okay. And that, that program was they got money through some federal grants and they used the first loan to do retrofit on the Commerce Building and then as that money's repaid, they.
take that out and retrofit other other buildings. And then um, when you prepare these background reports, um, what happens to the background reports in terms of when the comp plan is all pulled together in a big document? Is it sort of a technical appendix or? Basically, yes. Okay. And it doesn't need to be adopted officially as a background um, report? We haven't adopted those in the past. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions on this element? If not, I think we'll, um, this is a public workshop, so if anybody in the audience um, has any comments about this ele first element um, called climate change and sustainability, um, you can sign up and um, ask questions of staff or of the Planning Commission. Yes, sir? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is J.T. Dre, and I live at 902 Wetmore. Um, my comment would be uh, there is a lot of emphasis uh, from the Puget Sound Regional Council for transit-oriented development, and um, uh, I can appreciate the sentiment, uh, but it also scares me in some ways if the uh, transit part of the development uh, is not uh, developing in tandem with the other part of the development and what I mean by that is um, uh, I find that the folks that ever transit uh, are very reluctant to be uh, fulsome about their ideas about transit oriented development and um, for instance, I serve on the TAC committee, and we have not been allowed to see what their uh, portion uh, of the uh, update to the comprehensive plan will be, much less have any discussion about it. Uh, and I have the sense that if they were more interested and they tried harder, they could deliver us a product that would be more friendly for people who want to use mass transit. and. Um, Consequently, more people would use mass transit. Uh, I, and I just think of one example all the time. It's over on 100, the Ashway Park and Ride. Um, I don't know if any of you ever have occasion to go by there, but there is a huge complex of apartment buildings there. And at one end is the uh, transit uh, station. Um, it's very close by. It's right next door. but. Uh, if it went right through, it would be even more convenient, you know? And it's issues like that that uh, I would hope might get discussed um, between transit and uh, people that uh, are doing the designing of the transit-oriented communities. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this topic? All right. Um, with that, I, any other comments? Yes. I just had a quick question. When do we plan to see the uh, Everett Transit's portion? Uh, Alan Giffen, Planning Department. The uh, Everett Transit and uh, other transportation uh, modes will be addressed in the transportation element. Uh, the city is, uh, I should back up a step, the engineering department and the transit uh, department are managing uh, the uh, transportation element. They have hired a consultant who just recently started their work. Uh, we don't have a date yet. Maybe uh, later in the spring we will have some uh, more information uh, that we can provide related to the transportation element, and that will go through the Transportation Advisory Committee that Mr. Dre referenced as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So now we'll move on to another comprehensive plan element, and this is one that is being updated, so it's not entirely new. Um, and again, the text is available over at the table, so it's underlined strikeout. It's called Urban Design and Historic Preservation Element, and I think we'll have a presentation from staff. I'm Jan Meston with Planning. Um, 
And as Chair Stewart said, this is urban design and historic preservation. So this element addresses the three-dimensional environment and the quality of that environment, the image of the city and the um, character of neighborhoods and um, the historic character in the city. It is um, an existing element, and so this came forward to the Historical Commission in September and October um, and included changes from the uh, comp plan update audit and from citizen comments and staff comments. Then Historical Commission added their input um, and passed a resolution recommending Planning Commission adopt the changes to that point. Subsequently, we received changes from the uh, City Tree Committee. So those have been incorporated and additional changes have been um, made by staff. So uh, this evening I just wanted to go over briefly an, an overview of what the changes are to the element. There are a number of uh, elements that, or changes that um, support preserving, protecting, and enhancing trees on public property. We got comments from a number of sources um, supporting that. And also to strengthen and um, expand the tree and landscaping standards and the maintenance of landscaping on public property. There's also a requirement or, or a provision to require public buildings and facilities uh, to contribute to livability and community identity and a provision uh, to provide wayfinding signs, which is another a suggestion that has come forward from several different sources. We also added um, a new goal in the districts and neighborhoods section of this element, which is to focus on placemaking in the Metropolitan Center and the high density arterial corridors. Placemaking is a, a process, it's a people-centered approach to economic and community development activities. Um, it imagines public spaces, sidewalks, streets, parks, buildings, uh, as the heart of the community. And uh, this goal encourages it to be used as an integral part of economic and community development activities because it offers the potential to improve the gathering spaces and uh, create public spaces that invite interaction between people. Spaces that foster the social and economically viable communities. This is something that uh, Mary was, was mentioning in terms of we want for economic development, we just don't want people working in Everett, we want them living here and being um, enjoying the community as a whole. And it creates uh, or has the potential to create spaces that make people feel like they belong to the community, that they have a stake in the community, and, and that they want to continue to improve the community. So those are all uh, the overview comments that I have on the, the changes that, that you received in your packets to the element. Um, so I would be open to any comments that, that you might have on those. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, any comments from Planning Commission? I'm just yes. glad you're here and I'm glad you're speaking about this. I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner Sosin. I may, um, I, I would like to bring up the topic of the lovely array of historic buildings that we have in the city of Everett. I mean that quite genuinely. I'm all for preserving our historic buildings and our historic places. Um, and yet, I would like to draw attention to the fact that in the last year, we have had several um, unfortunate safety issues occur in buildings that were historic but very unsafe for people to be living in. And so what I didn't see in any of the narrative about our historic preservation and goals to continue uh, to keep those assets 
alive for the city was a discussion about upgrading safety measures and standards for those structures. And I think that we would be well served to at least have the discussion or have some policy directives that um, nudge us in that direction a little more strongly than we have in the past. Thank you. And any other comments from the commission? Okay. Um, so now uh, the public has an opportunity to comment on the urban design and historic preservation element. All right, doesn't look like we have any comments at this time. So any other questions about this element before we move on? Okay, thank you very much. So our third revised element of the evening is the economic development element. And I'll turn it over to Dave Koenig. Uh, Dave Koenig, planning staff. Um, the economic development element as the two previous elements are optional elements uh, under the Growth Management Act. So they're not required, um, but uh, over time uh, with the Regional Council uh, 2040 vision plan and countywide planning policies, uh, the, um, uh, these are items that we need to address. We don't have to necessarily have specific elements, but uh, years ago when we developed our growth management plan, we thought it was important to have uh, urban design, historic preservation, and then also the economic uh, development element as part of the comprehensive plan to put some focus on those types of policies and, and direction and have a community uh, dialogue uh, on those. So this is a updated um, version of the economic development element. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, the draft that you have before you um, reflects uh, some proposed changes in policy that have happened over time since the last uh, update uh, 10 years ago, uh, how the community has changed and also the direction of the community. So we tried to reflect uh, newer initiatives that have happened. Um, uh, it reflects desire to work cooperatively um, in, the, uh, within a partnership with the public and private sector um, because this is uh, a uh, you know, team effort in sense of economic development. Uh, you know, I mean, the private sector creates um, uh, uh, and, um, jobs at a much higher and um, uh, important rate than, than, than government, and so government needs to support uh, the private sector in its uh, uh, efforts to um, create more jobs. And uh, it also, um, since the, we did the comprehensive plan in the past, there's a new group that was formed to um, address economic development, which is called the Economic Alliance of Snohomish County. So we looked at their plans and uh, strategic goals and tried to reflect those in the plan. Um, not surprising, our economic uh, development element are reflected a lot of those goals, uh, but I was going to hit those. And then we also received um, comments from the Port of Everett, um, but in the fog of putting all the stuff together, uh, we didn't really um, uh, get their comments in. So <laughs> we uh, have a, a, a section where we're in the computer, in our computers, where we're going in and um, doing uh, this. So the port, I've talked to Graham Anderson's here tonight, but the port, and so they're going to give us some additional comments on the, this, the element that you have in front of you. They're going to look at that and give us comments on that. So they had given us an earlier vision, and, and, um, and, and Alan and I looked at it back in July, and Anyway, so <laughs> as I said, in the fog of the work, uh, uh, we uh, slighted the Port of Everett in their comments there. Um, and, and to um, look at um, the Economic Alliance, which is, you know, it's a group that was formed 
uh, to and merge several business groups to try to have a greater voice and a big a bigger presence and sense of economic development. Um, uh, they had basically in their um, strategy these six items, which was to market Snohomish County, attract new investment, improve quality of place, uh, respond to employer needs, connect to regional leaders, and engage the community. And as I mentioned, uh, our uh, plan uh, reflects a lot of that already, and where it didn't, we uh, made some changes in the plan to, to reflect this economic development group who uh, represents, you know, not only uh, Snohomish County, but also Everett, so. Um, the plan itself uh, deals with areas uh, to uh, address economic diversity. That's always been an issue here in Everett from when we were a um, uh, resource um, mill town to now where we are now a Boeing town. Uh, but, you know, it's always been the goal by the city from uh, when we started doing economic development planning as a city to look at d diversifying our economy and continuing to diversify our economy. Uh, the community image is another thing that we uh, address in the plan. Uh, and, and that's important from the quality of place uh, a place that people want to live. Uh, uh, our economy has changed such that um, people have options on where they can live uh, when they work. And, uh, the, and so this allows um, us to try to uh, give some policy direction to hopefully uh, that we create a city that people want to live here, recreate here, and, um, and, and work here. Uh, there's also the balancing of uh, the environmental quality and economic health. So uh, um, there's been a lot done in this community, again, from being the mill town to now being a, a community that has high-tech industry and, and still some mills. We are, uh, when we did the Everett Station Plan years ago, um, it identified Everett as an industrial cluster not just Boeing, but other types of industries and places where things are made and put together. And so, um, so that's one development, um, but we also are, uh, you know, a medical center and have more than that, more over time. We're encouraging um, uh, more educational opportunities here. and That continues uh, and hopefully we'll see uh, uh, if the legislature funds it, a new building starting construction this summer. Um, that's a WSU um, branch camp as expansion. And so, um, so but the, the balancing of that and such the newer economy versus the older economy and then you know, clean up of our industrial base, a lot of the industrial sites that we have um, have cleanup issues. And so there's been cleanups going on for a number of years between the city and the port. And hopefully that property in, in this next 10 years will start to redevelop and we'll see more uh, energy and such coming from those areas. Uh, we're in, as I mentioned, we have a lot of jobs here, but we're a regional leader in jobs. So um, we have, um, you know, uh, 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 a, uh, people commute into Everett. Uh, hopefully we can capture more of those people living in Everett, but with the number of jobs we have, we have basically about um, one and a half jobs per household, uh, so there's uh, a, a lot of jobs uh, compared to the number of households that we have here. Uh, transportation, transit, and rail um, are all important, and they are in the plan here in sense of being important investments. Uh, the port, uh, Port of Everett, uh, being an important part of our overall industry. And then also the city has taken a, a policy uh, position, and it's, it's in this element, is about air travel and Payne Field being used for commercial aircraft. So the city council has been very um, supportive of that, and so uh, the plan re uh, uh, reflects that. Uh, it also, the plan uh, looks at areas that are suitable for economic development, saying where, where do we want to see this economic development happening in the community. 
So it starts off with our waterfronts, which have historically been the mill areas where uh, people worked in the mills uh, creating lumber, uh, making nails, uh, making paper, uh, um, you know, making paper products, and that, and that was the roots we had, but now we've moved on to other things like airplanes and um, uh, uh, industrial uh, pieces of equipment for other uh, uses and such. But uh, showing that this is, it's an area we can see growth and we have a lot of land along the uh, waterfronts, both in the harbor and the river that is available for redevelopment. Uh, the Everett Mall and Everett Mall Way and other um, corridors, uh, the Everett Downtown, Everett Station being an area, North Everett uh, with the hospital and college uh, and uh, expansion up there, the gateway corridors that we have, and then uh, Payne Field and Southwest Everett, which has uh, tens of thousands of jobs, uh, with Boeing being the main one, but other industries that are out there from you know, um, food product companies, there's a several of those out there, to um, uh, um, other industries that uh, make things that uh, and are um, a part of the industrial uh, cluster that I mentioned earlier. Um, what's also important to um, support the, these uh, various areas and the type of industries is uh, having human resources. Uh, that's education and, and, a, and a job uh, uh, base uh, for people to work here and also have people who can take those jobs. So that's important to have those ed educational component and that's recognized. Sustainable development, uh, information base, that we have an information base as a part of the city. This is one area that I think we've, um, because of uh, staffing and, and the economics, we as a city, I think, can be, do a better job on an information base than we have in the past, and, and hopefully in the future we will. Uh, again, quality of life being an important thing to attract people here and keep people here. And then, uh, but always in mind, keeping uh, uh, in mind to grow on the positive qualities of the past that we, you know, we have a history, we have roots here as a community. And um, uh, it, it, one uh, Navy captain who worked here uh, for the Navy and also on some other projects told me that he, he saw in Everett in the community uh, and the workers a, a strong desire to do a quality job and do, you know, do a quality product. And I think that's um, shown in the airplanes that are built and the construction that's done around here, that there is a desire to do that. And I think having that, that positive history and uh, always trying to do a good job is important. And I'll stop there and uh, uh, take any questions or um, public questions, too. I guess a, a one comment that I had, um, and I think I was looking at pages six and seven, which is talking about our community image, and there's some updates um, that have been made here. Mm -hmm. um, but one update that I didn't see was the, um, the new downtown hotel. Um, and then another one that um, is going up right, right next to us here. Um, and then I thought a little bit about tourism in general and if that, um, if there's something that should be mentioned about um, uh, economic development and our tourist uh, industry in Everett. Okay. Anybody have any comments? Commissioner Jordison? Yeah, I just, uh, I would like to see uh, somewhere mentioned, uh, and I may, and maybe there was something, but I missed it, but uh, uh, we have a tendency to look south, and mm. I would like to do an about face and look north and reach out to Tulalip and the tribes and to think about a way that we can um, weave that into our, our heritage and our quality of life and how does that figure into our 
to our uh, situation here in Everett, I, I, I feel that it's, it deserves some mention and, and some integration into this. Okay. Other comments? Commissioner Adams? I appreciate the work on this. It was interesting to read through little things like the uh, sales tax percentage and how it's adjusted over the last you know, different reports that we've had. Uh, that I think are really interesting. One of the things that struck me, though, is it, it seems to, to lack any reference to small businesses and the impact of how changes in our community you know, play out on the small business side of things. Do other communities have a section within the economic development portion that deals with small business at all? You've got micro and or micro manufacturing occurring. You have all these people from Boeing who are retiring, and you know the, how we deal with them in the community and the economic development that could come from that workforce as it transitions away from Boeing seems like it's a huge opportunity for us. Uh, well, yeah, we can talk. About, yeah, that's that's really good because there's a lot of industries, some have moved on and such, but that were, you know, created by Boeing engineers and downturns. K2 skis, which now aren't made in here, but that was started by a couple Boeing, you know, um, um, uh, engineers. And then uh, and the, the region also, um, things like uh, water skis. You know, I don't, I don't relate water skiing here as, you know, as much as other places, but this is one of the places where most of those are manufactured. Right. You know, and so there, there are those things that are uh, outgrowths of, of um, that technology being here and using that technology for other things. So we can talk about that. Yeah. Just a small section even, just to mm -hmm. kind of build on as we go through. Thank you. Other comments from commissioners? Commissioner Sosin. Thank you. Um, a small typo on page seven, um, listing uh, new assets. Uh, the third one from the bottom where it lists waterfront place on the harbor side and riverfront. Maybe um, if that's referring to the project, it needs a capital letter. That's tiny. Okay. Uh, the other thing um, that strikes me about um, some of the policy directives in this section, um, for instance, policy 7.37 3, and 7.38 are about um, improving Everett's image by encouraging property owners, residential and business as well, to improve and maintain landscaping, plant, you know, plant trees and gateways. And the following one is, um, is about keeping properties, commercial properties, I think I've got the right number, uh, keeping properties up to code. But we have such a difficult time with code enforcement, I'm wondering if in this section and also in our urban design, um, we might consider adding a policy that strengthens our ability to do code enforcement, because um, so much of what we already have could be looked after in a much better way. Just curious if anybody else is, sees an opportunity for those things, or if this is even the appropriate place to do it. it. You may have a preference, staff may have a preference to talk about that in another section. Well, I believe it's mentioned probably in several sections of the comprehensive plan, just uh, either ongoing or strengthening our efforts at uh, uh, code enforcement, and the I guess the um, appropriate place to deal with that is really more in the implementation. We've, I think we already have some good policy language and we'll review this to see if there's some other places we can uh, reinforce uh, that idea. But um, uh, I know that we've, we've got that mentioned in, in several places in the document and it wouldn't hurt to put it in, the, uh, in this element as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Adams. I I believe one of the other, I think there was an addition in the uh, urban design with regard to, to signs. I think it's one of the places that a little bit of wording was added along those lines, but I agree with you and support any changes that would be along those lines. So. Okay, um, now's an opportunity for any members of the public to comment on the economic development element. 
Okay. Um, we understand from staff, though, that uh, the Port of Everett um, will be um, s submitting and have already submitted some comments that will then will have a, re a revision to at least a few of the sections here. So, uh, Commissioner Sosin. Question. Will the port's comments be integrated as part of our document or will, will the port have its own section as pertains to economic development? Um, well, they were, the comments we had were integration, mm -hmm. but separate from that, we will be bringing forward um, under state law uh, a port, um, uh, you know, deep water port uh, can have a element within the comprehensive plan to deal with, uh, you know, deep water port issues, and the port has proposed that. So, so the so that will be a separate element. But then there's broader interests that the port has, and they would you know, integrate that into this element. But separate from that, we will have a maritime terminal element. Um, it's mandatory in the larger port areas, Tacoma and Seattle. It's an optional one if ports want to do it in uh, the size of our port. And so and they, they do want to do it. And they've provided us something, and we'll be bringing that to you in the future. Um, any other comments or questions from the commissioner? All right, I believe that concludes our item number two. Any other comments from staff? I, I guess we're meeting again uh, next Tuesday. Correct, next uh, Tuesday the 10th. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're adjourned for tonight then. Thank you.